Welcome to the Rock Music Alliance interview sessions. I'm your host, Cole Coleman, along with Claudio Pesavento, an original member of Mahogany Rush and keyboardist for the Chris Squire Band. On our show today, you know him as the voice of the band White Lion and Freak of Nature and from his own solo career. So welcome to our show, Mike Tramp. Thanks a lot, guys. Hola. Thanks for Thanks for coming on, man. Mike, before we get lost in conversation, do you have any performance dates, tours, and releases coming up that you'd like to announce? All of the above. <laughs> <laughs> well, um, we're um, we're just about to release uh, Mike Tramp's Songs of Wide Line Volume 2 early August, which will um, be followed up by a two-month U.S. tour starting on August 23rd in Las Vegas and ending the 25th of October at the Whiskey on Sunset Strip in California, Los Angeles, California. And everything in between will be in America. <laughs> Very cool. Well, hey, that's going to end up right here in my town, man. I got to come down and watch. You got it. We're starting there. We're ending there. Now, um, yeah, I got here the album releases just for the people. It releases is Friday, August 23rd. That's cool. And what okay, name? Okay, okay, okay. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, uh, what what name will you be uh, touring under? Well, live it's Mike Tramp's White Lion because we're performing the White Lion songs. Um, the album is Songs of White Lion by Mike Tramp, obviously with a band, with a great band. Um, and, you know, that's sort of what that is. We're, we're bringing the original songs, which I wrote, together with Vito Brada back in the early 80s. We're bringing them back to um, to the stage. It hasn't been performed for, for decades. And um, it's sort of like the return of, of, of Indiana Jones. He's just a little bit older, but he's still the same guy. Gotcha, gotcha. Now, the, the release Songs of White <laughs> Lion uh, has weight and Little Fighter on it. What songs will White Lion fans be glad to see on Songs of White Lion Volume 2? Well, when we did the first album, um, I hadn't really thought it through that this was going to take off and going to be a con uh, continuing thing. When we took the first album to the road, it was, it was clear to me that people had been waiting for this. And... Uh, the first album is close to be a bit of a greatest hits. It's got it's got the big songs. So with volume two, we dug a bit deeper into what many would call the core of White Line, the, the big tracks, um, the songs that really shows that even though the band in many ways in the magazines and in the videos got compared or molded, put in in the same, you know, fold as many of the other 80s bands, the songs easily put the bands by itself with, with, with some of the big rock classic. I mean, we're opening the album with Lights and Thunder. It's a nine-minute rock epic. There are very few of the bands from the eighties that ever came close to that, those kind of songs. But that also showed where my tramp and Vito wanted to go with, with, um, with the songwriting. And, and we never, we never really got a chance to tell that story because getting known from the videos and wait and when the children cry and tell me a little fighter, you know, the three and a half, four minute songs, um, that were, they were part of the album, but you know, even though we were, you know, an 80s looking band, we were looking much more towards Journey and Kansas and, 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 and bands like that. And we were very much waiting for being able to put a permanent keyboard player into the band, not just to play a pad, but, but being a big part of the music, sort of stemming from, from our, our fascination with growing up with Deep Purple and John Lord and how big the keyboard played in those parts. It was just sort of in reality as we started the 80s band, there were only 
space for four guys in the car. <laughs> <laughs> gotcha, gotcha. So it sounds, sounds like, you did, like you have some progressive rock uh, influences going on, you know, that maybe you wanted to bring out, you know? Yeah, I mean, you know, I mean, I do think that all our influences comes from the 60s and the 70s, and they evolved in the 80s. And and I think that's that's it just became something that sort of just happened. Um, also, because let's not forget how visual the 80s became because of, 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 of the videos. Let's say that MTV hadn't happened. Maybe the music would have, people would have focused on the music much more than on the visual part. I mean, I'm I'm not I'm not I'm not dissing anything because I was a big part of the MTV videos, but I just know how much the image even influenced or like you know impacted us when we were in the studio, when we were writing the songs and stuff like that, and so and so. It was always lurking in the back that it was part of the song. Watch how's your hair, how's your how's your pants, what's the jacket, how's the show's gonna look like. Yeah, I totally agree. Yeah. Uh, what's that, Claudio? <laughs> well, I mean, I thought I just thought about something before. You went to a deep purple concert, but you went to a kiss show. Yeah. Right, right, exactly. Big exactly. Difference. Yeah, I totally agree. It's like, well, once, once things become visual, uh, you know, it's hard to ignore the visual, of course, you know, so uh, music yeah. really, you know, took on a multimedia aspect at that point. So you, you have to think about not just the music, but how are you going to present it visually, you know, so yeah, I, I totally get you there. Especially in the 80s. Yeah, well, you know, even now, because, uh, you know, people people release music now, but they really expect it on video anymore, you know, it's, it's you yeah, know, so... You know, people, I mean, well, I know that's interesting. Exactly. That's taking a completely different turn now. That's taking a completely different turn. Video, videos is almost something you do by yourself with your iPhone for Instagram or something like that, you know. Um, and 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 the competition is is enormous and 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 what you're gonna do, which I think that if you are a if you're a good strong songwriter that that and your music represents who you are and that you're not doing a job of fulfilling a commitment, but your song is a self-expression, no matter if you already know that you most likely will not be played on the radio. You have to make that honest commitment to the song and then just saying, well, so be it at least I did my best for me and I'm, I'm, I'm staying true to myself and stuff like that, you know? Exactly, man. Exactly. That when you were re-recording these songs, was there any thought given to reworking them as well? Like, you know, putting in new parts or new breaks or, or was there a focus on staying true to the originals? Well, I mean, we had to, we had to stay true to the originals, especially the guitar playing, because the guitar playing is basically note for note, but it's in a completely different key because um, for the for me to do these albums and wanting to go back there from being between 24 and 27 when I recorded the big songs of White Lion and being 63 today, it's it's simply impossible to to recreate the sound of my voice from those days. God knows I never would want to do I hear that again. So I was very much encouraged once Marcus Nan, the guitar player, and myself had worked on these songs for a while and on the demos and me hearing my voice coming back, it gave it a natural refurbish without changing it it just be, they became darker they became tighter while the music was was close to be be the original way the voice were now you know the one that had, had brought it into a different sort of you know dimension a re a, a, you know sort of like retelling the songs um in the way that I was speaking to someone yesterday that some of these songs that I sang about, I hadn't really lived that story. Now that I've lived the story, going back in and singing these songs, and of course, 
both lyrical and melody. It's it's part of my DNA. When I went in to sing some of these songs for the first time, I'd only known the songs for three weeks. And that's always the fear of most singers in you never get comfortable with these songs before you have done a tour with these songs. Live, you start you start becoming, you experiment with the songs. You're not afraid of the red light in the studio. You try different stuff. There might even be nights when you're a bit rough with your voice and you discover other ways of going with the melody. When I went in to sing these songs, I have all that knowledge with me. So I can reach in there and go, man, I feel so tight with these songs. I control the songs now before the songs controlled me. Well said. Yeah. Well said. Yeah. Uh, can you tell us uh, who are the players on the album? Yeah, well, I mean, obviously, the sound of, of, of Wide Line was always my tram and Vita Brada. Um, and so finding that, that guitar player that would be able to commit to that because it's basically surrendering yourself to a part and not bringing any of your own style or playing into that. Most players will not allow themselves to do that. They have to leave their own footprints. But because Marcus has so much respect for Vito Brada and those original parts there, almost like a classical pianist sitting down and playing Mozart, most people will not try to change Mozart. You only play in one way, or Beethoven for that matter. Going in and playing Vito Brado, most people would not want to do that because you cannot play it half-ass. You have to play it note for note. So once Marcus and I have established that, um, we got um, the rhythm section in, which has been part of many of my solo albums, Klaus Langesko and Kenny Andy on drums. Also, people that would want to be very, very true to the songs and not trying to go in there and, 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 you know, take up the spotlight and, 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 you know, leaving more of themselves, but, but instead of uh, being true to the song and, and making the song, the focus, not them. Yeah. Gotcha. Gotcha. Uh, and uh, I hear uh, Claudio did some work. And then of course, and then of course, you know, I, I keep forgetting, as I said earlier on, keyboard was something we always wanted, but it was a certain style, you know, we wanted. And um, Claudio, um, which was a friend of Marcus, got brought in and, and added some, some, some badass, true, honest keyboard to these songs. And so um, this is one of those things that um, was always a dream for Vito and I to have part of it. Yeah, that's great. And from what I've heard, I've, I'm really enjoying what you did, uh, the work, work-wise on it, Claudio. It's great stuff. What, what keyboards did you, uh, did you pull in? You know, is it modern keyboards or did you use some vintage stuff? Well, no, no, I mean, we're, 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 we're total vintage freaks. I mean, it's in the way that, that keyboard, the introduction of keyboard to me was always was was the the late sixties bands with you know, beat uh, Deep Purple, Manfred Mann, Yes, yeah. um, and in in America it would obviously be Kansas, you know, Steve Walsh, the Big Hammond there, or 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 Greg Raleigh in Journey and things like that. because the the Hammond organ is probably about one of the only keyboards that fits with the rock guitar. Yeah, honest, yeah. you know, and in, in the eighties it became the big hat that sort of just would glue and then of course we got the classic piano that's that's always there and and a bit of of, of you know you know roads and verlets again we're back we're back to to the, the you know the three or four main keyboard instruments like that have been used in in, in you know super tramp or or you know ufo those kind of things gotcha gotcha now you also play guitar did you uh, record any of the tracks uh any of the guitar tracks on the album well, yeah, I mean, this kind of guitar playing is is not my forte. <laughs> you know, so, well, you know, I mean, on on the last track, "Farewell to You," because we recorded that basically sort of um, as a live track. You know, you know, it, the acoustic guitar is my strong point. So it, there, but but you know, once it comes to that, um, I do play the second guitar live, but it has just as much to do with that. It. It enables me, interesting enough, to sing 
a bit different. It it gives me it gives me something else that when I when I sort of play the guitar, it gives my vocal a different freedom. And there there I I read towards two of my heroes like is Bruce Springsteen or Phil Liner from Thin Lizzy. Their vocal man is like is not in the grit, but it is in the grit. And they have this sort of freedom that I've searched for for 40 years. And it's just taken such a long time to find what it is that gives me that freedom that I'm not singing straight on the beat. Hmm. Interesting. Yeah. Now, um, talking about Marcus Nand, uh, you've known Marcus for quite a while. And it, I want to mention he is the guitar player also on the on volume one, you know, Songs of White Lion volume one as well. How did you and Marcus first meet? Well, I mean, right now we're in, in Denmark. And uh, um, when we were driving through Copenhagen the other day, Marcus said, it's it's 30 years since you and I played here. Wow. And, and, and Mar Mar Marcus came into to the band that I had after a uh, wide line called Freak of Nature. And um, he was a bit of wild, wild boy back then, a young, young guy and stuff like that. But I always, I always, the thing that I loved most about it was his energy and passion. And thirty years later, it hasn't, it hasn't diminished one ounce. And and so he's, he's my battery charger, you know. And I can go to him at any time, and I, I get, I get the energy back. Yeah, from the photos I've seen of him performing, it looks like he really enjoys performing, you know, a guitar, you know, playing guitar, but performing, you know. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and 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 he, and he's getting the credit for it, and 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 the audience. I mean, we were playing a big German festival the other day, and I had to tell the audience between two songs that um, I noticed they were looking at him, but I'm the star. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, you know, there always, yeah, there's always going to be people focused on guitar. It's that, it's that something about it. It's like an un unspoken mystique contract between lead singer and guitar player. It's like, it's just in every band, you know, it's, it's the lead singer and the guitar player just draw the attention, you know? Yeah. Well, I mean, it, it, it's, it's just really, really tough to create that between the lead singer and the drummer. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I guess that's it, it why could... I like, that's why a lot of drummers become singers after that. Yeah. yeah. I got, I got, I want to plug in a quick story here. Uh, when I was, really young, like a young teenager, my older brother took me to go see this fantastic new band that was uh, been uh, said was the house band at the Whiskey. And uh, I, you know, great, sounds great, you know, so it takes me up to the uh, Whiskey Go Go. And this is in the late 1970s, you know, so I walk inside. And of course, the house band at that moment is Van Halen. I know you're going to say that. Yeah, exactly. You know, and uh, I don't know who these guys are. I mean, and they, this is before they were famous. You know, they're they're house band at the whiskey. You know, it's before they were big. But everybody, every, there was a buzz. Everyone talking about this band, this band, you know, this this Van Halen band. And I just just wanted to mention. So I walk in there, and I during the show, uh, I'm looking around, and I notice all the girls in there are focusing on David Lee Roth. And all the guys in there, they're, they're looking this way. And all the guys in there, their faces are over here looking at Eddie. <laughs> it was just funny. Yeah, it was that like, was that, an amazing moment, man. I mean, you know, for, for, for the lucky, for the lucky ones who have seen the great bands in their early stage is, is to me, I probably do. the, the true, the true, you know, like finding the gold. I mean, you know, it's like, once a band becomes big and, and, and gets up on that big stage, a lot of things gets added and, and it, it's just natural that it goes there. But to been to have seen, you know, Zeppelin or Stones or, or Van Halen, you know, or ACDC in the raw form in the clubs. Ah, oh. that would have been amazing. You and know, then I, somebody I, that I mean, you know, as I go around America or the world, people come to me and says, man, oh, we saw wide line in the clubs. So to them, that's how they feel like like the, the story you're telling. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I was just love that, that. New York when that happened. Uh, was that Claudio? I was living in New York in, in early 80s, like in 1981 to 88, 89. And I was going to Lamour and Brooklyn and Lamour and Queens. And I played there because uh, my band was managed by Liver and Krebs, the, the match, Steven Taylor, uh, sorry, Aerosmith and yeah, yeah, ACDC. Yeah. So I was wondering if you, if I crossed paths with you there because I was living there. What was your band? <laughs> Mahogany Rush. 
of course. But when I was living in New York, I was doing a lot of freelance, like, it, you know, they, they need a keyboard player for gigs, you know, I just play whatever. I go to the Nirvana Club and I go to China Club, all those places. Yeah, of course, yeah. Well, I mean, actually, the, when when I met Vito and, and, and he was telling a, a, a similar story, when he went to see um, in New York, or I think the concert was Journey and Mahogany Rush. Yeah. And... And and he's sitting in the audience, and then this loud guitar starts, and underneath the curtain slides Eddie Van Halen out, and they weren't really listed on the bill. And after Van Halen had performed, Vito went back and seen, I've seen the future rock and roll. <laughs> That's yeah, it. It, was, it really was something. It's like when, when Van Halen came out, it really was a a revolution taking place in, in guitar playing. It never it was not the same after that, you know? It just just like as we all know, like in around 1992 when Nirvana came out, and it just changed the world. You know, yeah, I mean, it's great. Time. Yeah, it's yeah, great. It's amazing. I well, had guys, the same feeling when the iPhone came out. Uh, yeah, yeah, same thing. It, it just <laughs> You knew that the world was changing. It's a totally different thing going to be taking yeah, exactly. place from now on. Yeah. Amazing. Well, guys, let's take a sample listen to uh, one of the songs from Songs of White Lion, Volume 2. Uh, here's about a minute and a half of Lights and Thunder on the Rock Music Alliance. Sounds great, Mike. I, I'm digging that song. I like the vibe. You know, it sounds to me like it's got a progressive rock influence in, in that song. You know, maybe maybe it's, maybe it's the the organ in that song, but there's the, the punches and the organ. Uh, it just it feels progressive to me. If you like progressive rock. Did you guys ever think about exploring music in that direction? Yeah, I mean, we definitely were. I mean, I mean, when when. Again, when you say progressive rock and stuff like that, we're, of course, still, like I've mentioned maybe once or twice already, you know, then we're looking at bands like the, the American keyboard bands like Journey, uh, Kansas, and 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 maybe even Styx. Um, we're not talking Emerson, Lake, and Palmer, or, 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 oh. or, or Yes, for that matter. Um, that was a little, little too far from us. But we always knew that, that with the keyboard added, it, it would it would allow a different dimension to um, the whole perspective of 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 um, 
of the songwriting and and musically when you have a keyboard you can do big intros you can do big middle eights and 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 you can do great outros and you can get you can make like an eight minute part in the middle of the song where they get to, where the singer can go out backstage and change his jacket <laughs> <laughs> you know, yeah it takes, takes it to and, yeah, and of course direction. i mean uh, it's just the way it is I, I i i love i just think that in the in the beginning it was just you know you got the electric guitar and then you know you just form that band but you know i knew it from the start that we always we always wanted that and um you know i mean the fun the funny story or or at the same time, the sad story. There were a lot of 80s bands that were using keyboards in the 80s on stage, but the keyboard player was off stage because somehow there was this like illusion or, or, or idea that it didn't fit into the visual of the bass player, the, the guitar player, and the singer in the middle. And you go, that guy with that big fucking thing with the with the ebony and ivory, but wherever we put him on stage, it just doesn't fit right, you know. So you know, um, both Ozzy and 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 I, we were touring with Cinderella, and they had a great Hammond player. He's behind the fucking PA, you know, standing there with a sad look on his face. And after and and the sh and the after show party when you know we're hanging out and the backstage is all full of girls and he's going around nobody fucking recognized me. <laughs> but I'm the yeah. keyboard player, you know. <laughs> yeah, I, I knew a couple of guys that were doing that. They were hired to uh, you know play the keyboards and and trigger and you know, tr trigger things, and they were off stage. You know, they, they kept them off stage. Unbelievable. I, don't, I never understood why. It's like just stick that guy on stage. Why not? You know. But, the uh, stage was a big enough for the guitar player. <laughs> yeah, there was there was a uh, there was a feeling that you know the keyboards just aren't rock. You know, it's just you know blowing the blowing the feeling. But yet they wanted to have them, so it's just bizarre. You know. Yeah, no, no. I mean, you you hit it right on the nail. It's like that's well, how can you explain that? And the question is, you can't. You can't explain it. I've of course, uh, you know, there are times on stage that I I. I tell some some big stories and 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 the keyboard story is 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 one of my big stories. So there's like three or four chapters to what we just talked about. <laughs> got it, got it. Now, I, well, I just, 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 just for myself, I got a uh, now, Claudio. You're you're the keyboard that I'm hearing, right? You're doing the parts in that song. It's, I'm an AI. Yeah. <laughs> well, I'm what did you use in that song? Wait, what what am I hearing in that song, Claudio? I use the uh, Arturia Hammond collections that they have all these vintage sounds you know it sounds very much like it sounds great stuff. it sounds it sounded very very original to me uh, it sounded like a, a but, vintage uh, live i like uh, i like to use uh, leslie even if i use a uh, regular keyboard regular organ the the, the the leslie is what makes the you know the sound that sound basically right. i remember when i started the tour with mahogany rush my first ever tour it was like 1980 81 actually um i have like a small cube you know you know the roland cube for keyboards you know yeah yeah and then frank have like a four faint cabinets a stereo in each side of the stage and i have like a little monitor whatever so the first date of the tour you know i say well i can't hear nothing because the, the guitar was so loud on stage he plays really loud actually so i had to get the next week i went i got some couple of marshals you know? <laughs> so i was be able to to you know to cl click it out you know so uh, uh mike where did you record the album at well i mean in the old days, we would we would we would tell a more interesting story because we had the money to go into the big studios and 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 live that decadent life while we we're recording the album, which was both good or bad because sometimes we spent more time, you know, polishing our sports cars and and Harley Davidson and then inside creating, you know, the songs and, and and so on. So these days, you know we're up against the wall we really have to make logistics part of the songs in 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 that nothing will suffer based upon that we almost don't have a budget to record an album which the rock fans still are expecting to sound 
as good as the most expensive album done. And actually, in reality, many people coming to see, you know, Mike Tramp's Wide Line in the Clubs still look at this band as being a major band, but we're standing without even, you know, three red lights, you know, and, you know, shining or stuff like that. So it, it's it's always something, it, it's a, a bit of a mental, you know, um, thing you have to go through that, you know, well, you know, we still have to deliver the show or the music like we were on a massive stage with the full, you know, modern PA and, and moving lights and smoke bombs and so on. So even though we're standing in a, in a Mexican restaurant playing and stuff like that, but okay, back, like I said, back to the original, song. the album was re- the album besides the, um, the keyboards that, that, um, that Claudia played was recorded in Copenhagen, Denmark. Is that uh, Soren Anderson? Is he involved? Yeah, yeah. I mean, again, you know, you build up, you build up a team, and you and you go into to work with some somebody that can work under that pressure and and under that that the that time period that we're allowed to, you know, sort of, uh, you know, before the, you know. Uh, the, the the bar tap is too big that your credit card is not you know can't cover it anymore so i mean i've done the last 10 albums together with soren so you know we go in there and we got you know and the band is of course was well rehearsed so i mean you know we're able to we're able to knock knock the songs out in you know two or three days you know and then um and then you know just uh, do the vocals after and then um get it, Claudia to, to, to play the keyboard and, and then mix the album. So, so the recording, the recording session becomes a little bit more surgical than artistic. It's all, I mean, it's all, there's no room for errors. There's no room for experiments. At the same time, we're also going in to record an album, uh, uh, re-recording songs that have already been printed in 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 its format and its its arrangement and we're not really messing around with that so it's really just a matter of of getting the right the right take right okay i, I got it were there uh were there any special guests uh uh brought in for the uh for the record uh beside i had my friend johnny gioli who's a singer from uh, from hardline a good old friend um come in and 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 help me with the background vocals um also to give just a little bit i mean in white line i sang all the harmonies also and it almost ends up at times becoming sort of like a keyboard uh, you know chord of, of, of the same thing. So I've always been a fan of having a second voice. And so when that opportunity uh, or, or, or that choice or that wish came about, I, I, you know, I called Johnny and says if, 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 if he was uh, wanted to, or would help me sing on some of the songs. And, um, he did a phenomenal job, and I think the combination of, of his voice and my voice, you know, creates, you know, uh, a nice blend. No, absolutely yeah. does. Absolutely does. Now, uh, we touched I'm on not... this a little bit earlier. Oh, go ahead, Claudia. What you got? No, I just wanted to tell you that talking about recording, like in the 80s, you know, when I started to work with that band, Mahogany Rush, I become a member or whatever. So we go to the studio, and he doesn't have the songs writing yet. So we spent so much money on those studios, like experimenting right. and writing, like a, a lot. Like, I, I've I've heard about that back back in the '80s when when the when the budgets were big. Yeah. Uh, sometimes a lot of the uh, like writing was taking place yeah. in the studios. And so some people felt like that sort of thing shouldn't take place in a recording studio, you know. Even I was jamming, uh, I was jamming uh, my myself doing sound check whatever for the part, and then they record what I was doing and they put it out on the album. It's like it's weird. <laughs> I said, wow, okay. Yeah, it that can is happen. a chapter. I mean, that issue in itself, I mean, that's even, I mean, that's that's so ridiculous. And and I can't even tell the best story. I mean, some of the bands prior to me with the insane stories, but when, when you look at that, you're in the studio, some bands were in there spending a million to two millions of dollars. Exactly. And today, today we're recording an album for $10,000. Yeah. yeah. Oh, yeah. It's tough. It's tough. Interesting, though. I mean, uh, it, it's valid to do that 
if you're experimenting, I mean, I can definitely see, you know, like the, the recording arts have also gone through their revolutions, you know? And so it'd be like when you're recording the song, sometimes the engineer has ideas, you know, like, hey, let's try doing it this way or that way. And so some experimentation could take place there. But but nowadays, I, I don't see that happening. I mean, it's just, you know, it, every, everything is cut to the bone now, you know? So it's a lot of people recording out of their homes, you know, a lot, a lot of musicians recording themselves. So... It definitely is. I mean, and and since you brought it up that way, of course, obviously that wouldn't be the, be 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 an issue going in and and recording songs that have already once before been released. But let's say you're going in, not just a young band, but a new band of 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 of, of a capable musicians, stuff like that. You have to make the decision that what you're going through is is as much for yourself as it is for the final product because there's no record stores anymore there's no kids or fans waiting in line waiting for that store to open knowing that the album has been announced two months before that it would be be in the stores that day and and the excitement there there's almost no one waiting um so now it has come down, and I've even discussed this with people in when I do interviews and 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 known what are you going to do next? And could you ever consider now that you've gone back to uh, to record these two wide line albums and you sort of sort of back in the hard rock world? Would you consider doing another hard rock album? And the thing is, for me to go in and record a new hard rock albums of songs that I will never play live. I have to find a reason for that because it's it's almost like, you, you know, going on a road trip with four or five of your best friends just because you need to do it for your soul. Um, there's no other reason to do an album like that um, for anyone to do, you know. So that will definitely be a decision in the future. The albums you're doing is really just to show that you have committed your life to the arts of rock and roll or music and no matter if there's a business or if there's not a business or if there's an audience an audience when you wake up or when i wake up there's a part of the day that i need to write or experiment with recording music and 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 i guess until i can't do that anymore i will do it if it will be released it's another story interesting yeah very interesting yeah, Plus, you need to be in a room with five guys working together, I guess. Without cell phones. Yeah. yeah. So you live, you live in Swiss, uh, sorry, you live in uh, Denmark. Uh, me and Marcos live here, and uh, the yeah, other well, guys. I, I have, a, I have, a, I have, a, I have a. When people say I have a studio, it means they have a computer yeah. and a hard drive yeah. and some microphones. So um, I I have a um, I live on a big on, on a big farm. When I say big farm, is that I have a lot of buildings here, and so I built I built a big room that I call my studio. But basically, it's just a massive living room with couches and stuff like that, and it's built for you know, and it's got all the pictures of heroes and stuff like that. It's a place you go in there to be inspired. It's not a place you go in there to work, and so. Obviously, one of my my missions is to do an album like that, that first of all, I don't start, but I'm part of. And it's not a My Tramp album, but it's an album that My Tramp is part of and stuff like that. And 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 it's it's all gonna be it's all gonna start out from from how you the heroes start started out, how they went into the studio, opened a bottle of white wine and and started playing. We'll be right back after a word from our sponsor. Attention guitar players, join the Thimble Slide revolution and free your slide finger. The Thimble Slide is a mini guitar slide designed to be worn on the tip of your finger, about three quarters of the way down your fingernail. When worn there, you can still bend your finger, and most importantly, it's allowing enough of your fingertip through so you can press the guitar strings. The thimble slide is larger at the back and smaller at the front, so it follows the contour of your finger. So when you're wearing the slide, it's not loose or rattling around on your fingertip. This also allows your other fingertips in nice and close for playing. 
the sizing gap allows you to make the slide a little bit larger or a little bit smaller for a nice custom fit. So while you're wearing a thimble slide, you can, of course, use it as a slide. But more importantly, it allows you to still fret the strings so you can play the guitar. You can play chords. You can play lines while wearing it. bend strings with your ring finger. You can drag your fingertip across the strings if you need to. You can do pull-offs, hammer-ons. So there you go, you can actually still really do all the things you need to do to keep playing guitars like that. With its patented shape, you can slide and fret while wearing the thimble slide. Visit thimbleslide.com. That's thimbleslide.com. Thinking about the re-recordings here, I wanted to ask you, uh, I, can, I can hear, of course, we touched on this a little bit earlier too, but uh, I, I can hear that the songs are being done in different keys than the original. And uh, I think it sounds great, by the way. Um, but uh, I was wondering if there was any difficulty in reworking some of the songs, like maybe they just don't work in different keys, or uh, how do you feel about presenting the songs in their different keys to an audience? Well, the difficult work were for Marcus Nant, not for Mike Tramp. I mean, in that way, I'm just the one telling him that I have to sing it in that key. Can you find it out? And he did. Yeah. Uh, he's, he's done a, a, a job that is is. Um, Incredible. I can guarantee you one, there's none, no known guitar player, even if I paid them big money, that could do that. It it would be against everything they stood for. It required a complete love for the guitar and a complete love and respect for Vito Brada to go in and do that. It says, I'm going to master this. Uh, and this is also, you know, I mean, I know it's 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 bringing some, some big names in here, but... The word is that no classical pianist would go in and play Mozart or Beethoven in a different key than Mozart had played it in. You know, I mean, that's just, it's just, that's not what you do. You don't go in and paint a mustache on Mona Lisa. It, there's just stuff like that. But in this case, I mean, there are a lot of singers out there trying to croak their way through the last chapter of the career. And I think, I think the, the problem is that sometimes, you got to allow yourself and you got to accept yourself that you can't button the pants you wore in 88. So you just buy a new pair. And and maybe the fans would also allow you to go out there and accept that you actually have grown and you have not chosen to go out there and 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 talk and ask the girls to show their breast or or, or shit like that on stage when you're when you're some of them are grandfathers <laughs> and, and I, I just find it very hard to see some of my heroes fall on their ass and not decide to have evolved and that the career evolved. You could actually go out and be kiss and show a bit of involvement instead to go out there. And I'm like, what is this? So for me, it wasn't really a matter of saying, I can't sing like Mike Tramp in 83. No, I don't want to sing like Mike Tramp in 83. I don't want to sound like Mike Tramp in 83. I want to express and I also want to show that the songs and the lyrics have stood the test of time, that they're not a joke in, in 2024 and they can be performed in a pair of jeans and a denim jacket and a telecast around your neck and still show how strong the songs are. Because you know what? The audience are also 40 years older. Well said, man. Well said. Bravo. You know, uh, I, I honestly think that was a, a, a brilliant decision. It was a good decision to do. And they sound great to me. I, I'm, I'm really actually enjoying them in some ways really more, you know, in their new keys uh, the vocals I, I, can say that I have not done 
I've not done one interview or, or read any reviews where anybody didn't say any different when you just said. There That's might great, be yeah. people that decide to say, well, these songs are in a different key. Okay. But that's not the point. The point is that this is this is done on purpose in both ways, both for it to sound like a transition has gone in those 35 years since, you know, that last album was released. What yeah. else would be the purpose of it? Right. You we know, know. And, and, and so, you know, I without dissing something that obviously is the reason why I'm here today. Um, the production doesn't stand um, up to going into the future. So maybe in reality, even though I can tell you it wasn't the plan, but maybe it was also that they could go into the future with a new production. I mean, the goddamn a redone King Kong 20 times. <laughs> Exactly. Very true. Well, you know, the most important thing is whether a song works or not, you know, like, you know, does it work? And that's really all that counts. And these definitely work. And so there it's a good it's a good presentation. And, you know, for a lot of people who would be hearing the music for the first time, they'll never know. I mean, this is, you know, it, 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 this is how they're being presented right now. And the songs work. And that that's really, really what counts. Plus, the song it, sounds, it, they sound really fresh. These songs, I they mean, do. Uh, they do. Those I like are the word. Those are the words. We were yeah. playing a big, we were playing a big German a rock festival uh, uh, last Friday. Um, a little bit of a different festival with some different names, so it wasn't like a classic. Most of the audience, also because a, because a storm was coming in, it didn't come in. But the big video screen behind us, which had the logo of the band, was taken down. So in reality, maybe sixty five percent of the audience had no clue who this band was, but the word that came after the show was a lot of people turn around and says, who the hell is this band? This is a great band. So now you're judging a band on what you hear, not on, on anything you see or what you maybe preconceived minds and stuff like that. And I think before MTV, that was how people discovered music with their ears. With the radio. <laughs> that was it, man. You heard the music for the first time. You had no idea what they, they looked like or who they were. You were just hearing the music, and that's all that mattered. That's yeah. great. Yeah. 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 Well, I got to ask this question. You know, it's a journalistic kind of thing to do, but I, I have to ask, have you been in touch with Vito Brada, and has he heard your remakes? Yeah, oh, yes, it does. Uh, not including that. I mean, Vito has given the blessing and become really close friends with Marcus. And they talk almost every third day about guitars and stuff like that. And 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 uh, it was Vito's birthday, um, 1st of July, which I don't know when you're going to broadcast. This was yesterday. And, you know, I called him and wished him happy birthday. And, and, and we've been going through a little bit of you know you know bickering through the years and stuff like that but at the end we realized that we had gone through some very special things together and we had created something very special and Vito is just you know i mean the whole world doesn't know because he hasn't made an official statement but to me basically he just says you know like i had my time i'm not going back on stage i'm not going back in the studio wide line was everything for me i got everything out of it that way Leave me alone. Interesting. Yeah. Well, th thanks for telling us, for bringing it up, you know. Uh, so with the release of Songs of White Lion Volume 2, do you feel like the legacy of White Lion is complete for you now? Or do you foresee a Volume 3? Well, I mean, that possibility is always, I mean, it, it would be an easy thing to do because the songs have already been written. Um at the same time, I also want to be honest in, in the interview that when I recorded the first album, I hadn't planned a second. And before I recorded the first album, I had no plan of ever revisiting White Lion. But over the last sort of 20 years being a solo artist, I've never shown up at a venue without half the poster saying something about White Lion. So I almost 
couldn't run away from it. And 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 bit by bit, I start. You know, this was when I was out there. You know, sort of becoming you know a troubadour, just touring around the world with an acoustic guitar. And and I I've I've all these songs I've done acoustic versions, which is also why I realized that these songs could be sung in a lower key and and much more from the heart. But at the end, it was just, you know, for me, for me to uh, get away from the big grizzly bear that was chasing me was to turn around and, and give it a big hug. And so, so I took it on and I found, and now over the last year and a half, when I've been playing these songs live, I've actually fallen in love with the songs that I wrote back between 83 and 87. Well, Mike, that does bring us to the end of our, our uh, discussion today. Uh, I want to wish you good luck with the forthcoming album release and the coming tour. And uh, people listening, you can keep in touch with Mike at MikeTrampOfficial.com and, of course, on social media. You know, Plus, something new, find the Rock Music Alliance on Patreon. Join us there and you can get stuff and uh, look for our exclusive content there as well. Maybe we'll even have something there with Mike. That'd be awesome. Mike, hey. thanks. For yeah, go ahead, man. Listen, man, it's been it's been my pleasure. I mean, I, I I I think that you know to to sort of end up with something, yeah, um, and 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 you ending up on 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 young kids and wanting to be and stuff like that. I mean, back you know we were always caught in between two things back in the eighties, and and especially me coming from Europe, wanting to say something that took a long time to explain and something that was serious and not fun and interesting in an interview um, because the 80s were, were fast. The 80s were about having a great time and not, or at least making it look like you didn't take it serious and stuff like that. With deep down inside, you really wanted to take it serious. So now, later on, when you get to tell the story, there are actually two sides to what the 80s were. There were the facade, there were the front cover, and then there were the inner sleeve, which told sometimes a different story, even though it might be blank. And um, I guess in reality, it's just part of the big wheel that's turning, and you just got to have to hold on somehow and 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 make sure you stand your ground the as much as you can you know you're going to have to compromise here and there when you then get to the point where we are right now you're in full control but you also are both aware that there's only so much left and therefore you're going to do it 100 percent your way there's no compromises there's no budging it's my way all the way Wow, man. Well said. Yeah. Well, you know, Mike, thanks for being our guest today on the Rock Music Alliance interview sessions. Thank you, guys. It's been a pleasure. I'm Cole Coleman. And for Claudio Pesavento, the Rock Music Alliance, and the RMA Awards, thanks for watching and listening. Visit us at rockmusicalliance.com and check out this year's RMA Awards for rock, metal, and progressive rock music.